Hi, welcome to Serlin on Design. Today we are talking about the video game, The Ghosts of Tsushima. And I think it's going to be a little bit tricky to explain exactly why it's so good, but we're going to try. So Serlin here, and my co-host is Mr. G Phantom, who is an artist, photographer, and design buddy of mine. Hi there. Hey there. I'm super excited to be here to be able to talk to you about Ghosts of Tsushima. Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit difficult uh, to explain what's so good about this game. What do you think? You think we can do it? We can definitely give out our, our best effort, but uh, there's a lot to say. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if people out there have not played Ghost of Tsushima, that's fine. You can still watch almost all this episode. We're not going to have spoilers, except at the end when we talk about the story, but we'll be clear when we're going to do that. And also, this is not a review. We're talking about the game design of the game, not really a traditional review. If you want a review, I'll give you a real quick one. I give it a 9.5 out of 10. It's great, and you should buy it. <laughs> I'm guessing you think similarly, G Phantom. Is that right? It was my favorite game from the last generation before the PS5. So, yeah. Okay. So if we were to review it, we would give it thumbs way up. But let's try to explain what's really going on with this game and, and why is it so good. And let's start with why is that difficult? I think it's difficult because the game doesn't do much new. It, it doesn't particularly stand out in any area. You know, if you take a, a macro view of the game, it's your standard AAA action adventure game yeah but so then why is it so good <laughs> well yeah yeah i mean i'll try to help us out i i think the the short version is that the sum is better th than the or it's it is better than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. but there's more to it than that it doesn't like fully capture it so i wanted to give us a couple tools to think about it and i'll give you one right now and then like halfway through we'll add another even more helpful one so the first is from the architect, Christopher Alexander, and he wrote a book back in 1954, maybe, called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, which I'd like to think of as a book about just how to design anything. <laughs> and one thing he talks about in that book is how it's really hard to talk about something being well-designed without talking about the negatives or impurities, the lack of those things. His example is like a tea kettle. What is a really well-designed tea kettle? It's one that doesn't burn your hand when you try to pick it up. It's one that when you pour liquid out of it, it doesn't splash all over the place. It's one that doesn't fail to whistle when the water is boiling. These are all lack of, of negatives. And he's saying that is a good language to use for design. And so one thing I think we're going to start off here is to think about the lack of problems that this game has. <laughs> I like that perspective, pointing out the lack of problems. Another thing that Christopher Alexander talks about in Notes on the Synthesis of Form is the concept of form fitting context. So context means the world that we live in or the parameters of the design problem in the first place, whereas the form is the thing that you're making. And so a really simple toy example he has is that iron filings will create a certain pattern or shape when they're in a magnetic field. And let's say we had a kind of unusual project where we wanted to arrange the iron filings in such a way that when we turned on the magnetic field, they didn't move at all because we had already set it up to, to be exactly the same. So if we did that, we could measure how far off we are because there's equations that determine exactly where these iron filings should be. Maybe we're off 2% or something. But of course, in the real world, the context is so complicated, so rich and diverse, you can never really fully define it. And that's why it's so difficult to design things that fit it. So back to the real world and, and games and this game, Ghost of Tsushima, this is an open world game, right? And it's for human gamers to play. And it's just right off the bat, automatically, it has to have a certain form, right? There's a bunch of things that it, it has to do. Maybe you can speak to some of those. Yeah, well, open games, one big thing that it has to do is allow the player to travel that world, which is a really difficult task hmm. for game design. 
It also has to have a world that feels engaging and is full, like life and things for the player to interact. So there's a lot of ways to fail on those things. But as we're trying to say here, Ghost of Tsushima really dodge those common uh, common mistakes that are in those games. Yeah, let's list a few more things that it, it just has to do to have its form fit the context. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you mentioned like basically side quests. It's got to have a bunch of those. And of course, main quests that drive you through the story. It's got to have a whole bunch of locations you visit. Probably should have some crafting to kind of mm-hmm. give you something to do. There's just a lot of activities, a lot of things. It's a a bunch of UI stuff it sort of has to have about how do you really keep track of like where you are and what you've done. You can kind of look at this in in different ways. Like any game of this sort needs these things, right? (laughs) (laughs) And and so (laughs) when we say that this game has these things, it's not like enormous praise. It's just really understanding the shape of of the tasks these designers had. They just have to check off all of these boxes if they're going to make an open world game yeah. to begin with. And and they can't be things that get in the player's way and make them upset or angry to deal with or just makes the game unfun. Yeah, exactly. So let's think more sp- specifically about that and go through what are some things that this game has and had to have that it didn't screw up on. It's honestly like, <laughs> it sounds like it's a backhanded thing, but it's a pretty real comment to say it did not screw up a, a large number of these things. Mm-hmm. It had an opportunity all over the place to oh, yeah. fumble and it, and, it, and it didn't. I'll start you off. I know that you're a fan of the horse. Do, do you think they fumbled how the horse works? No, the, the horse works really fantastic in the game. You grow an attachment with the horse. You know, it's easy to control. It's there when you need it. They did a fantastic job. Easily a place where they could have totally screwed it up. They they nailed it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love that it comes in almost instantly. The only thing they could have done better is like an Elden Ring where it, it teleports right below you. So it's there like one second faster. So they had a, a little bit of realism by having it run in, but mm-hmm. you get on it quickly, you move around. It handles well. It just does everything you, you would want a horse to do. What else though? Okay, so the UI is really excellent in how minimal it is. I'm talking about the, well, the menus are good too, but I meant the HUD there, mm-hmm. how they're, they're so little to get in your way. Most games of this type would have a mini map taking up part of the screen. They do not have a mini map. And why not? How do they get away with that? The answer is this kind of unusual feature of the wind. And I'm a big fan of that. It, did you, did it work for you as well? Oh yeah. I thought the wind was ingenious. That It's one of the few things that I thought the game really actually innovated on. Right. You know, we were talking about mm. how the game follows the same formula as, as many other games that it's not, you know, the most original thing or, or anything like that. But the, the wind was incredibly innovative with how they had a problem with navigation and they needed an, a really new and artistic way to solve that problem. Yeah, so for people out there who maybe haven't played the game and don't know what we're talking about, most games, if they need to point you to the next objective or something, uh, there'll be like a big video gamey arrow on the screen that would point you there. And there'd be like a mini map with some dots and arrows that also are trying to point you there. So this game has none of that. And the world it, itself, like w- within the fiction of the world is what I'm trying to say. There's visual effects of the wind that point you towards the next objective. And you can set that in the overall maps. You can say, I want to go to this certain place. So let's have the wind blow there. Or maybe I want to go to the next story objective and it'll blow there. It's also nice, the controls for that, using the touchpad on the PlayStation controller. So this is an example where they knew what the hardware was. This is a PlayStation exclusive game. They didn't have to come up with something that would also work on other controllers like a Nintendo or Xbox controller. And it really, they really took advantage of that. It simplified the UI because they could count on that hardware. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, what else worked really well? Um, Combat. I think combat, yeah. It's most of the game. So we should definitely talk about that. So combat has two parts to it, right? There's this whole stealth angle and then there's this samurai sword fighting angle. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give your opinion on on one or the other or did you like the the separation of of how each is handled? Well, what I think I really admired about the game, how I handled the combat and the different fighting styles and different play styles, really, if we really want to break it down, is that it's a lot of moves 
And when you're trying to put together a game where you have your player do a lot of moves, it's really easy to overcomplicate it and screw up the UI, make it just difficult to access certain moves over other moves. And so then there's weird hierarchy, you know, what moves are important, what aren't. They've, this is not a problem with Ghost of Tsushima. They're all really accessible in a way that is, there is a learning curve. We, we can't get around that. But once you get on, over the hump, it's actually very intuitive and it like really makes sense. And so I think that's what really connected me with it was just the thoughtfulness of having a lot of moves and dealing with that. You know what's interesting to me about your answer there is that what I was trying to ask about was more the combat system and how that works and how you interact with enemies and all that. And you talked instead about the controls, but that just shows that it's so interwoven. It's hard to talk about one <laughs> completely separate from the other. To kind of build on what you're saying there, there's many games I can think of where I think they they thought about their combat system a lot and they came up with something they thought is good. For example, they thought we're going to have a whole bunch of magic spells that you can cast. And they maybe didn't think about the UI or the way the way the player actually controls it until the end. So how do we actually let the player select all these spells? Maybe we should put them in a huge linear list that they just go up, 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 you know, to scroll through or, or right. something. And you want to get to the sixth one and like tough luck. Yeah, this game did, did not do that. It's really clear to me that they started with the PlayStation controller in mind and they thought, how can we fit a lot of things onto this controller? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, they are so intrinsically linked, the controls with the gameplay. You know, if we want to take up, talk about the actual combat itself and just, you know, separate that from the user interface aspect of it, uh, they do a fantastic job of making the two styles, swordplay and stealth, feel uh, really unique, but also still really interwoven and connected in a way where it's kind of seamless between the two. Um, and so you can hmm. make a choice at like, oh, I'm going to be only swordplay or only stealth, or you can kind of mix between the two as well and like have a hybrid. So it, it's it's a good balance. And again, a lot of opportunity to screw that up to favor one side over the other. But they did a they did not do that. They did a really good job making sure that both play styles and hybrid plays are legitimate ways to play the game. Yeah, I, I agree. And just as they uh, have to go back and forth between stealth and samurai style combat, maybe we here can go back and forth between the combat system design and the control design. Because I want to say one more thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about the controls. I mean, they are very closely related. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was saying how it's clear that they had the PlayStation controller in mind. And I've been involved in design projects. I know all about the limitations of a controller. Yeah. It's tough to fit a lot of moves on a controller. And there's something that I don't know if it's like actually innovative, but I maybe it is because I can't really think of another game that that does the move selection the way they do. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So they're fitting as much as they can on the controller. Now, some something they do that is the most normal thing in the world that a, a million games do. You hold down uh, L2 and you are now like a, in aim mode with your bow. Okay. And then R2 is shoot. Oh, great. But what is a little unusual is that when you are in that aim mode, you now have shift buttons, uh, your, the four directions on the D-pad uh, to, to change, let's see, different aiming weapons and then you have the four each one of those four then can be shifted with the face button the four face buttons to have four different ammo types for each of those weapons yeah so that's it shifts within shifts and it's in each case it's four exactly four because that's how many directions cardinal directions on the d-pad and that's how many buttons so it's all designed around that mm -hmm. then there's even more shifts because you can hold r2 and that Let's see, when you are holding R2, the four face buttons then shift into your different stances, if I recall. And then mm -hmm. your four cardinal directions on the D-pad shift to different ninja-ish weapons. That's right. Again, it shifts within shifts. There, There's just so many things that are crammed on this controller, yet it's quick to get to any of them and just like a shift in one other press. So I, I was really impressed with that. I guess I would not 
call it a plus excellent in that it is a, you know, a little bit of a learning curve to deal with all the, all those shifts. So it doesn't feel like perfect, but what I will say is that it's hard to think of something else on a console that has this many options that are as easy to get to as they are. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And the thing is, is that I don't know what an A plus version of this looks like. This is so close to it. And this is as close as you can mm. get considering the amount of moves, right? If you, if you wanted it to be much more intuitive, you would have to have less moves, I would think. But they put in, mm. a, they put in a ton of moves. And because of the way you can access the moves and how thoughtful the controls are, that's where it really empowers the player to um, express themselves in combat with the different style. Be able to be a little sword, a little stealth, or all sword, all stealth, because it's just... The, the, the controls allow you to do that. If the controls were not designed in a thoughtful way, you would go into this moment of like, well, I'll just pick the best one and just stick with that, as opposed to being able to organically adjust and figure out how you actually want to play you can uh, go the samurai way or the the ghost way which is more of a ninja way there's really there's more to it even than that yeah, there's yeah, also yeah. archery is al almost the third style yeah. and even within any of these there's a whole bunch of builds because you get these things called charms which are power-ups or you can think of them as cards in a card game where you build a small deck of power-ups mm -hmm. and they really radically affect how you play. So there's there's a lot of expression through builds going on, but the big highlight that they're focusing on is the sword fighting, which we will call like the samurai style versus the, I, I guess you call it ghost <laughs> style, which is a ninja -y style. And you've touched upon that, but it's such a, it's such a big part of the game. It's worth really emphasizing again they did not mess up on that at all. I feel like each one is really fleshed out. When I'm doing all the sword fighting stuff and I've done a bunch of builds uh, around that, it, it just, it feels good. There's the, the parry is fun. You can perfect dodge at the last moment. They've got a mechanic for that. There's a bunch of charms that support that play style. And, and, and same with the stealth, okay? The stealth is built out pretty well. I've heard a lot of controversial takes on it though. Some people think it's too simplified or two pared down of stealth. I didn't get that sense. I, wh what did you think of the stealth? Uh, I did not get that feeling. Uh, I thought the stealth was very well implemented in the game. It felt actually mm. really natural and part of the game as opposed to a gameplay feature, mm -hmm. which it feels like in more kind of classic games that had stealth. So I really enjoyed it. Again, they did. They made a lot of choices to make it feel good and just keep the player engaged. I think one of the reasons why I like it most is because while in stealth for this game, I'm not worried about like an attention meter or weird kind of like gamey aspects. I can just focus on the environment and the position of my character in relation to other enemies. And I think that's why I enjoyed it. It kept me in the moment. It is pretty simple. So the, the way it works is you press the giant touchpad on the PlayStation controller and you go into what they call focused hearing mode, which is like the basically stealth mode. And in that mode, uh, things are black and white except for the enemies, so they stand out. And something I think is interesting is that in that mode, you can see the enemies through walls, like they'll be highlighted in red. You kind of have a wall hack when you're in this sneaking around mode. And the irony here is that ability to wall hack means it's not realistic because in real life, when you're sneaking around, you can't see through walls. And yet at the same time, it is more realistic in, in the end than if they hadn't done that. So what I mean by that is if you were really in the situation in this world, you were sneaking around, you would have a sense of where the enemies were just around a wall right in front of you because you could kind of hear them. Again, this is called the focused hearing mode. But in the real world where you're a player in your house and who knows what kind of sound system you have, they can never really count on or design the whole game around on some super realistic, <laughs> you know, 3D sound system. Yeah. So they've simulated it. They, they've done a, effectively you would have an idea of where those enemies were. And mm -hmm. so that that really worked 
for me. I think it made it feel better than stealth in a lot of other games I've seen. Yeah, I agree. And we'll talk about this later down the line, but it just, it fits with the vibe and the mood of the game. Even though there's little gamey element of like seeing through walls of red enemies, it kind of works because of the character you're playing and the world that they Mm -hmm. live in, which is primarily bamboo houses with sheep doors and stuff like that. So it all kind of works out and it never feels like it's a dumb thing (laughs) you know i can't think of a better adjective but it doesn't feel dumb it feels very smart another thing i wanted to mention about the stealth my game designer sense is tingling on one little thing that they they did I, i feel like i know why it's there so when you're sneaking around what's the point like why should you sneak around as a player okay the answer is because you can assassinate people in like one hit and uh, you know avoid a lot of the other parts of the combat system So that's your reward. Okay. So then to make that more developed, to make stealth a whole play style, what do you do after you kill that first person? So you kill them and then what? You got to sneak around and one by one kill the whole camp. Well, you need more than that. And so they came up with this chain assassination thing. So when you kill one person from stealth, there's a brief moment where right then, if there's someone else nearby and you have put talent points in this sort of thing, then you can execute or assassinate like a second and even a third person like super quick all in a row stealth is a lot about that then you can even use a smoke bomb to become re-stealthed again so even if other enemies saw that chain assassination now they can't see you if you smoke bomb and then you could chain assassinate in the middle of all the smoke okay sounds great so we've now started to flesh out the one side of the equation But maybe to make that interesting, it becomes a little like too good relative to the other side of the equation, (laughs) relative to like, hey, I don't want to sneak around. I just want to like show up and and sword fight people. And there is one more mechanic on the sword fighting side that I think they added in to balance them off. Like you're not really supposed to think of it that way, but I think that's probably how it got there. And that is the standoff feature, Mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty cool. So you you just run into a camp and you say, hey, here I am. And you do a little mini game where you get to beat three guys, four, five, depending on how far you are in the game and what you've invested in. You get to beat them in a very quick mini game, which is sort of analogous to the chain assassination thing if you had snuck around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. It sounds like a diss to say, oh, they did a thing to balance it out, but... I don't think so. I, I think it's a real, again, a thoughtful thing that they did. Other stealth games that claim that you don't have to do stealth, okay, but like you really should play stealth in these stealth games. Like that's how I feel about other spe- stealth games. This game with the stand up mm. feature really is saying, no, seriously, if you don't want to stealth and you just want to be like a loud guy who goes to the door of your enemy and announce that you're here to fight, you can do that. And it's a legitimate way to approach battles that will, that is just as successful as sneaking around. And I really appreciated that. That showed that they really did care and think about, hey, there are going to be play styles and, you know, there are going to be players who want to express themselves in this way in this game. And so we have to give them power to do that. Let's cover a few more things that they could have fumbled and didn't. But we don't need to go into very much detail on those. The combat is such a huge part of the game. Yeah. I feel like that required this discussion. But to, just more briefly, we can touch on the environment, for for example. The mm-hmm. environment is, it's it's beautiful. I don't know. I know you're a huge fan of the environmental art in this game, so I should let you speak. Yeah, uh, I mean, outside of just the general beautiness and the photographic nature of it, I, I consider the environment in Ghost of Tsushima a, a character on its own. It's not just a level that you're traversing. It rains, it sun rises, um, it has all this different weather, uh, the grass is long and constantly flowing, and it works together with the wind mechanic. It's another character on its own. Yeah. I'd like to mention another game, Horizon Zero Dawn, which is also has a beautiful environment, and just compare and contrast something really quick. That game is really beautiful. It's a little tough to say who's more beautiful or something, but I know from the behind the scenes and the making of Horizon Zero Dawn that they were very conscious of nature photography, of this concept of golden hour, which I'm sure you are very familiar with as a photographer yourself, where the sun hits just right 
that makes things look really good. Now, golden hour uh, might not be exactly the same hour depending on the environment. What if it's a snowy environment? What if it's a sandy desert? What if it's a forest? So each environment has like a perfect optimal lighting condition to take your photograph. Right. And so what Horizon Zero Dawn did was they said, we're going to make everywhere in the game always golden hour for that place. Like you only ever see the most beautiful side of each locale yeah. of, of each little biome and ghost of Tsushima did not do that. They <laughs> went the opposite direction where they're like, no, we want a day and night cycle. We want weather to change. And I think that's an interesting choice because the, like if the other choice is maybe more beautiful, maximize everything for beauty. The oh, Ghost yeah. of Tsushima yeah, yeah. choice is making it feel more real, maybe giving us more of a connection to nature. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I thought that was an interesting way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Next point, crafting. Wow, crafting is more easy to fumble than even environmental design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so many ways to do a crafting system and they, they did a really extreme thing here in how simple it is. Yeah. And I think that was a, a conscious choice is that there's only so much focus the player has. And I think they just didn't want you thinking very much about combining this and that, uh, that there's enough with, the world and the story and the combat, they just had enough other things to focus on that I, I don't think the crafting is like accidentally light. I, I think it was a calculated decision. Absolutely. It was very clear to me that oh, one, the recipes are not, they're not recipes. They just, they're, they make sense. If you want to upgrade your sword, you get steel. It's that's it. Yeah. You, that's what you need to find. Um, and they just made it so it worked with whatever it worked with their overall progression system. And that was something that you didn't have to think about as hard in terms of keeping recipes in your brain, but just understanding that when you come across this stuff, just go and pick it up real quick. Okay. One last thing I'll mention before we move on to a different uh, take on all of this. The thing they didn't mess up is the presentation of the story. And I don't even mean the substance of the story or what the story is about. That's a thing that we'll talk about a little bit later. Just the way it's presented. And as a contrast, I've been playing Diablo 4 lately. And again, I'm not even talking about the content of the story of Diablo 4 or who the characters or themes or, or anything. Just how does the story get delivered to the player. Mm -hmm. And in Diablo 4, a thing that is very common, really common, is the NPC will speak and it's excruciatingly slow. And so you constantly want to click the next button to get to skip to the next line because you will just read the text on screen of what he was going to say. That's like the way I think most players experience the story <laughs> in that game, right. unfortunately, is like clicking through really slow dialogue. And... Ghost of Tsushima is night and day different. I never even thought about how it was presented because it was so natural. Yeah, absolutely. They, this is a team that clearly understands cinematic storytelling. So their cutscenes really... And pacing. And pacing of the story. <laughs> they also do things where characters explain context of the story while doing things. You're not just standing there doing nothing and getting something explained to you. You're like riding your horse to the next location or you're sneaking around town. You're like actively doing stuff that moves the game's, the game's story forward while they're talking to you. And it just feels like it's all interwoven and connected and very well thought of. Yeah, exactly. I mentioned earlier about this concept of Christopher Alexander's, how he sees design and its form-fitting context. So remember, who is this for? It's for gamers. It's for video game players who want to interact. And they might want story, but you sure get bonus points if you can deliver that story while still letting me move around <laughs> and yeah. you know control the camera and traverse the environment. And yeah. it, it's not that Ghost of Tsushima is alone in this or is the first to do it's a common technique in many games what we're getting at here is that they didn't screw it up yeah that's right they didn't <laughs> screw up there's also technical stuff they didn't screw up uh, uh, i mentioned horizon zero dawn a second ago 
amazing production values in that game. But there were a lot of times in Horizon Zero Dawn where I thought to myself, ooh, hard to make a AAA game, isn't it? Because <laughs> I would see facial animation <laughs> bugs that, that really took me out of it. I, n- I never thought about that in Ghost of Tsushima. It just sort of worked. Yeah, definitely. Let's go on to our, our next phase of thinking about this game. Well, before we do that, shouldn't we talk about Yomi 2? Yes, we should. Yomi 2 is a fighting card game that I designed. And uh, what is a fighting card game? Take a fighting game like Street Fighter, for example, and you put it into card form so that anyone can play it, even if you don't have the dexterity or reaction times. But I've captured a lot of what's interesting and cool about fighting games into card game form. And right now, the digital version of Yomi 2 is available on Steam and Epic Game Store. And I think the production values and UI are quite nice, if I say so myself. Do uh, you have some thoughts on the game? I know you've seen plenty of it. I think it's one of the kind of most polished card games that I've seen in a very long time. It really does look beautiful, and the presentation and the way the moves look and the, the art of the cards... It's just very colorful, very lively. And in terms of the gameplay, I just really appreciate that. You've taken Yomi 1, which was a really solid kind of facsimile of like the fighting game, but we really got the core aspects and made it a lot simpler for someone who might be new to this card game to understand a little better. But it doesn't sacrifice the depth of the game. And so I think it's really exciting to be able to play Yomi too, and I really hope everyone gives it a chance. I really had to put on my design cap when making Yomi 2, because one of the big things that we, I think we've managed to pull off is that it is a lot simpler and more elegant than the previous game, and yet it also has way more trappings of fighting games than the previous one did. So mm-hmm. now there's high and low attacks, where you need high and low blocks, there's projectiles as a whole class of moves that that really mean something. There's super meter. There's a better implementation of what happens when you're knocked down. There's a concept of frame advantage where I'm like ahead of a few frames and it's a little easier for me to land my move than yours. (laughs) There's even a new thing about gems where you select a gem for your character and you can customize them. Yeah. And just last note is that it's not all about a multiplayer. There's a whole single player campaign where you try to be the best Yomi player in the city and you get to hear the social media, the fake social media commentary from all of the people in that world that you're competing against and befriending on that journey. Yes, very cool, very exciting. Hope everyone checks it out. Yep, so try a Yomi 2 on Steam and Epic Game Store. And now let's talk more about Ghost of Tsushima. I was saying I thought that we had covered not even half of really what's going on in this game because it doesn't quite do it justice to say just what it didn't do badly. (laughs) So I wanted to tell you another concept of design, and it is also from architect Christopher Alexander, but this time a little bit later in his life, he wrote a series of books, and the first one was called A Timeless Way of Building. He then, if you want to look this up yourself, wrote... Uh, a pattern language and the Oregon experiments. And those are all kind of related, but in a timeless way of building, there's something he talks about. And I'm going to ask you to kind of bear with me to the audience, because it sounds a little out there, a little frou-frou, a little made up, (laughs) but I know where he's coming from. Okay. He was a super analytical guy. He really wanted things to be as quantified as much as possible. So when he talks about something that is, sounds super subjective and out there. I I give him the benefit of the doubt and I think I see what he means. So he's making a claim that uh, that is obvious to me, although it does seem slightly controversial to some people. Okay, even though there's sub- subjectivity in design, it doesn't mean that just everything is equal. You can't just throw, uh, you know, a dart at the board and that's your tuning variable. There really is such a thing as something that's better designed than something else. (laughs) And it's hard to define or quantify that. We all know that it is a thing and that it's hard to define and quantify doesn't mean it isn't a thing. It's just, it gives us a challenge of how to analyze it and how to talk about that. Sure. And here's the concept that I hope will help us. It's something that he called 
a quality or the quality without a name, the quality without a name. He's trying to talk about a concept that there just isn't a word for. And he uses words that do exist as kind of guideposts. Like it's sort of this and it's sort of that and it's sort of the other. So you have some idea what he's talking about. I have some of those words here. Those words are alive, whole, comfortable, free, exact, egoless, eternal. Remember, he's an architect, uh, although this really applies to a lot of kinds of design, but he's talking about spaces or buildings that have these properties. And it isn't that being a comfortable space is the ultimate goal and the thing that everything has to be designed around. It's just, that's part of the quality without a name. <laughs> there, there's something about patterns. And again, he wrote the book Pattern Language next. There's something about the way that different pieces of a design connect together, where they fit together just in such a pleasing, tight way that you get this quality without a name and you sort of get a feeling of wholeness or aliveness or comfortableness and so on. And I feel like the thing that he struggled to explain is sort of what is going on with Ghost of Tsushima. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a single word I can think of to describe what I'm trying to say. I think cohesive would be the closest, but it's not quite the whole story. But there's a lot of different things in this game at different even levels of abstraction or levels of detail that all contribute to this goodness that it has. Yeah. I know it sounds vague. We're doing our best. I think what we can do now is start to list some of the details and how they are adding up to that cohesiveness. Yeah. So I can start us off. So how about this? We talked about very briefly that the world was beautiful, right? That in itself is cool, but it's not that you have to have a beautiful world. I mean, what about Caled in Elden Ring, which feels like the world has cancer and it's, and it's awful. It doesn't mean Elden Ring is bad. Mm -hmm. So why is that important here? Well, it's because the beautiful world is actually important to the story. It's beautiful for its own sake. And that's interesting and feels good to, to hang around in. But the Mongols are invading and we need a beautiful world to defend. Kind of like uh, in Lord of the Rings, the Shire is the <laughs> reminder that it's worth saving from Sauron. Yeah. Absolutely. It would not make sense if it was a, a apocalyptic hellscape. No one would care if that was being invaded. Yeah. How about all the ammo and weapons of the game? It's a little difficult to design an interesting combat system when you don't get to use magical spells and energy shields and just whatever your mind can dream up. They have a lot of constraints. And what they came up with works really well. Okay, that's nice on its own, but also fits perfectly in the world. At least I felt that way. D did you get the same sense about like when you pick up wind chimes, you know, of all the things they could have put in the game, wind chimes can be hanging on people's doorsteps. So you can find them all over the place. So it's very clever. That helps you in stealth, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's great for helping the player learn about the world. Mm -hmm. Like wind chimes are in houses, black powder are found under houses, uh, and flowers are out in the wild. And it is not some like weird gamey thing where this stuff is like randomly strewn about all over the world wh where it's like in other games, kind of just find things at random. Um, it kind of makes sense and it just makes the whole thing feel cohesive. Yeah, yeah. There's that word cohesive again. It. There's just something pleasing about how the ammo and weapons just fit really well within this world. I guess it makes it feel more believable, more more immersive that it's yeah, that if, you're really part of it. Well, it feels like it's more lived in, right? The wind chimes are there because the the characters that inhabit this world that we're trying to save, which is also beautiful, um, hung them there. It feels like it all connects to the bigger story of like this is a world that's being lived in. <laughs> And so, of course, that's where these items are going to be. So along the same lines, it's all of the different activities that you do in this game. We mentioned at the top of this that 
it is an open world game. And so in order to make an open world game for humans, there's a bunch of things you have to do. You can't be too one note. You want to distract the human and kind of have them do one activity and then another and another so they don't get bored. And it does that. But it does that in ways that really build on this cohesiveness. Uh, I'll list some of them for you. So, of course, you do a bunch of sword fighting, but you can take a break from that and you can do platforming puzzles around shrines. And those shrines feel like part of the world. And you see those Tory gates at the, at the beginning of the shrines. So, so that's a, like a UI thing. It's like a signal to the player of what you're getting into, but it feels totally natural and enhances the world rather than the opposite, rather than takes you out of it or, or feels discordant or something. Mm -hmm. So there's a list of several, several more. There's foxes you find that you follow around and they lead you to Inari shrines, which give you more slots for your charms. There's places where you can get a, a headband by uh, doing a haiku poem where you observe how beautiful the environment is. When you increase your life, you do it by sitting in hot springs that you find around the world. You practice your sword fighting by striking through bamboo to increase your resolve, which is like your super meter in fighting game terms. But what else is there? There's golden birds that lead you to the next important place nearby so that they can be a thing in the world rather than a video gamey arrow. What else? Oh, the wind is a big one that we talked about earlier. A again, it's something in the fiction of the world that is being used instead of a video gamey icon or something. So all of that stuff just really works well together and makes the world, I'd struggle to find the right word. It feel believable, lived in, real, something like that. Definitely feels connected and it feels like it fits in the world, right? It's, it's not like just a bunch of random characters telling you to go to different places. It just feels, it feels like a nature thing going on. Yeah. So there's also the theme of the game, of course, which is about the rigid rules of samurai versus break all the rules and be a, a ghost or, or a ninja. So that's a theme. And then there's story that supports that theme. And then there's gameplay that perfectly mirrors that theme as well. We are, we've already covered that. But to give just a few more examples there, I hope it's not considered a spoiler. I don't know. But you do get something called ghost stance later in the game. And it makes enemies afraid of you. And that's an example. Of like that could have been anything. They, they, they could have given you any random power up, but they gave you a power up that really resonates with like, it makes the gameplay match what's going on in the story that you are becoming a, a kind of powerful that is a little bit scary. Uh, on the other side with the samurai sword fighting side, there's a whole mechanic of duels. And in a duel, you get rid of a lot of the mechanics that are elsewhere in the game, all the sneaking around stuff. And you just do a one-on-one -on -one, feels like a soul caliber fighting game style thing that is very samurai ish. Those are examples of mechanics that are interesting and fun on their own, but they really support the theme. And so there's extra, oomph, there's extra value to them because it's also <clears throat> connected. Yeah, it does a really good job at making you at making the player care about their choices as a player, not just because it's like good for the gameplay. In a way, they are affecting the story, maybe not literally, but to them emotionally, it like leaves the mark. And another huge example is Mythic Tales, which I know is one of your favorite things in the game, I think. Yes. You mentioned that to me. Yeah, I think it's, I think you can make a whole game based around Mythic Tales. I would love to play that game. <laughs> that sounds great. So what, what a Mythic Tale is in this game, you get power-ups, right? You get things that make you stronger and, and give you different moves. That you could just find them in a chest randomly or whatever. Okay, a, th a way to make it a little more impactful would be if you did a quest and then you got it as a quest reward. So what a Mythic Tale is, is that 
you do a quest and you earn that power up, but it's told in such an exciting and grandiose way <laughs> that it, you get really invested in uh, the lore and it just feels like a huge accomplishment to get these powers. It could have been any interesting quest, right? Just like I was saying a second ago, we could have given you any power up for ghost dance, but they gave one that fits the theme. So these stories enhance the history of you know your understanding of the history of the world. And so they, they just work on so many levels that they're, they're so satisfying. Is that what you, you like about them? The, the lore aspect or, or is it even the, the accomplishment aspect when you finally get to the end? The, the main thing that attracts me to it is just the general excitement of it all. Mythic quests, they're not super common, right? They come in very specific times in the game. And the minute you see that you can even start one is so exhilarating because you know it's going to mm -hmm. have this big bombastic story told by a very big bombastic character and that the actual missions themselves are actually pretty fun and engaging. And again, they all fit a theme. So I think it's like all of that together, but the just the initial excitement is like enough for me. Let me move on to just give a few brief criticisms of the game. And then I think we should talk more about the story. Uh, I have very little to say negative about this game. Uh, all, the, the, all I have is that the duels, which are really fun, I actually wish they were a little more in-depth and a little more Soul Calibur. I did enjoy them, but even more moves and more interesting AI uh, is something I, I was wanting for. My biggest criticism is the AI of just all of the enemies throughout the game. I think you get you become so powerful in this game that it becomes too easy, even on hard, and setting it to lethal with a one shot you or whatever is, is not that interesting. Like I, I wanted more challenge and more reason to use all my powers. And then the final thing is I kind of wish that there were huge Elden Ring style bosses. <laughs> I wish there were big set pieces. Yeah. My criticisms are pretty light too. I agree with you with the difficulty of the enemies. I wish they were a little more difficult. I wish there was more variety in their strategies of attacking me. I also wish there was more interesting defenses that they had. But that's something that they can improve improve on. I think that's largely my main criticism. Uh, my old criticism, which they then eventually did repatch uh, with uh, subsequent updates, was that encampments were one and done and you couldn't play them over again. So. They eventually changed that where you can now reset them, which is really great because those are really fun to take down. But yeah, really light on complaints. Again, I really enjoyed the game, so I don't have much to uh, complain about. Yeah, it was a really good update when they allowed you to reset the camps. The other thing that they added that I cared about even more than that is the ability to save loadouts of charms. That was a big deal to me because mm -hmm. uh, with that, it means you can set up like an archery character and then like a stealth character and you can switch between them very easily. Without that, you can still switch between yeah, like, yeah. just as easily as far as the gameplay cares, but just the logistics of actually clicking through all the menus without the saved sets <laughs> was so tedious that you yeah. just ended up not doing it much. So I, I really liked that they added yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the I forgot ads. about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. That was super good. So now we've reached the part where we can talk about spoilers. I think we should talk about the story. We don't need to cover the whole story or all the things that we liked about it, but let's talk about the ways in which the story supports the thesis that I was saying earlier, like the cohesion and how mm -hmm. it, the, the intersection of story, theme, and gameplay is so tight. Yeah. I'll just start out with something really simple that most people might not even have thought about, but right at the beginning of the game, like the first, okay, the first second of the game is the the battle that you barely survive. But right after that, the first part where, yeah. you know, the, the game proper starts, uh, you meet the character Yuna. And I think that was a very clever design choice to, to have her character exist and have her be the intro because she is the opposite of Jin. Jin is highborn compared to her, a peasant. Jin has been brought up with samurai style beliefs, whereas 
Yuna has to sneak around and steal in order to survive. So she's there to, to teach you the other way of life and to give you a different perspective on life, really. So I, I, it was, it, it's a subtle you know, choice to, to start with that. I thought it was, it was good. Absolutely. And also she appro- having her, that character come up as the first character you encounter also helps with it helps the player get into the groove of becoming a ghost as opposed to just if it was like an inner dialogue thing or some cheesy tutorial mode. Right. It's like it just fits organically with it. And as a player, you can buy into becoming the ghost whenever she's yeah. around. So the big theme is samurai versus ghost and which method of living and fighting is the right one. So you have Lord Shimura who raised you and he represents the ultimate in strict thinking. And then I guess Yuna is sort of the counterpart, but not exactly. She's only just someone that starts you on that path. Yuna isn't doing brutal stuff like you are sort of forced to do later in the story. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I wanted to talk about that duality about how Lord Shimura wants you to do one thing and yet circumstances kind of force you to live in a, in a more dishonorable way just in order to survive and how you thought they, they did, did they pull it off? So to me, it really worked like exceptionally well, the match between gameplay, whether I played the sneaky way or the samurai way. That story really worked for me. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the strongest aspects of the full story is the room for interpretation of how your playstyle fits in the world, right? You know, in the story, Jin does ghost stuff. That's the way the story is written. It's not a choose your adventure. It's a linear story, but it never comes in conflict with like how you play the game as a samurai, right? It all just logically makes sense with the character's motivations. Do what they do, yet still allow you to align yourself with your, again, player expression, how you play. Where it doesn't feel stupid, where it doesn't feel like you're doing something the game doesn't want you to do in the narrative. It just all fits together and allows you to enjoy the story while playing exactly the way you want to play, which is really hard to do. Yeah, it was really hard to do. And I think I see the trick they use to pull that off. So I mentioned that Lord Shimura is the ultimate samurai influence and he's always disappointed in you when you're not acting that that sort of way. <laughs> so I think that the way they pulled off the story fitting like no matter what you what style you choose is let's say that you went way into the stealth ghost stuff. That's really easy to make work with the story. Right. Because then Lord Shimura is just always upset with you. And of course he would be. No, that, that's kind of the easy route. It, it just writes itself. But what about the other one? So yeah. if you're being like super samurai ish, even then there are times that are just so dire that you have to do this underhanded ghost stuff. And in that case, mm-hmm. I think the interpretation that, that holds it together is that. Yeah, most of the time you're doing what Lord Shimura wants, but when it really counted, you had to do a few things the other way. And that's disappointing. You should rethink your life and so on. So it's either like these horrible moments as business as usual or as the occasional exception. But either way, he's going to be mad about them. So either way, like all of his dialogue still works. That's right. Yeah. And and Sakai, uh, the main character, is always conflicted throughout the entire story anyway as well. Yeah. Uh, well, that just helps with that interpretation I was just saying. Another yeah. interesting, along the same lines, thing I found interesting is the whole poison plot line. Poison is analogous to some horrible chemical weapon or something like that in our world, where mm-hmm. even in war, like, are there limits of things you shouldn't do? These are not questions we're going to answer here, but I just thought it raised legitimately interesting questions about should you use poison in that case? I certainly understand. I I understand the argument. It's a survival. Maybe there's no other way, but it's a really awful 
thing to have had to have done. Well, I think it really it also fits with the the enemy that's come in. the The context here is that the samurai usually fight enemies that are domestic, unruly villagers, rebel uh, uprisings, and stuff like that. This is a foreign enemy, right? The Mongols are not. They're a new, brand new threat. So it becomes a lot more of a question of like, yeah, okay, I get in the world where we have to put down a tiny village like Yarikawa, we where we can be all honorable and stuff. But these guys are like, they play with a totally different set of rules. So what are we to do? And uh, Lord Shimura will not adapt. And Jin Sakai is forced to adapt. It's basically the way that yeah, the story right. goes. Uh, it's it's just a little right. detail, but I found it super interesting when uh, the caretaker character mentions that uh, you, Jin, are actually more like your father than Lord Shimura. Uh, it really gave me a new appreciation of the whole thing, because without that line, you might think that you, the main character, Jin, are destined to be the samurai way. But that line makes it sound like, oh, so the father was... A little bit of a maverick too, a little bit of a free thinker, and maybe it's Lord Shimura who's boxing you in and making you something that you weren't supposed to be. Yeah, and again, it helps the player justify again their play style and how they approach the game. It gives the player a little bit more agency in a way. With a brief line that just says, "Hey, you know, your father wasn't by the book either. He was a little, he was a little sway." <laughs> the other big story beat that. I don't know if it even supports our thesis here or not, but I, I feel like we just can't talk about this game without mentioning it is that caretaker woman. Yuriko. Yuriko dying is just emotionally brutal. And it's mm -hmm. it's notable in, in so many ways. Like at the beginning of this whole episode, we were saying lack of problems is, is like a key element of good design. Think of all the lack of problems that had to go into that storyline to make it as emotionally powerful as it is. There's all these things that could have made it stupid with how it's presented, how it's mm -hmm. acted, how it's paced, maybe technical errors, but it didn't have any of those problems. So what we're left with is just, again, the emotionally brutal situation that we players have to reckon with. Yeah, anyone who's watching mm -hmm. this part of the episode has hopefully played the game and they know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't screw up the writing. Emotional moments are actually, I think they can be difficult to write, especially for video games. And they did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, and about the quality without a name, let's try to wrap it up. Even that character's death, I feel like is contributing it to it. Because... There's this concept of wholeness that Christopher Alexander talked about. And can you really have a wholeness of this story in this world without experiencing some tragic death? That's part of it all. Like the mm -hmm. honor and pride and disgrace and life and death. It's a big game and it, it manages to cover things from so many different angles that there's a, a fullness to it that. It makes it feel real, not just the writing, but the writing, the weapons, the combat, the theme, the world, the side quests, the lore that comes from the mythic quest. Yeah. I hope I've explained at least somewhat, at least the tip of the iceberg of <laughs> what's so difficult to explain about this game. I mean, do you have any closing thoughts that you can maybe say it better than I have? I think the only thing I can say is that I think the reason why it's so difficult to nail down why it it works so well is that it is a number of several aspects that are successful that we could take combat and we could literally do an entire hour discussion on that and we could do an hour discussion on art design and we do an hour discussion on the story and so on the presentation I think that's why it's so difficult to talk about. It it just does all the all several aspects really well, and then when you interweave them in a, a cohesive um, lore and a story and just general kind of legend of it all, it it just creates something that is really magical. I think so. Uh, that's how I'd explain it. Uh, it's it's not concrete, but I, I hope people understand that it's just like. 
it's just a lot of aspects that go yeah, into it's it. It's the crisscrossing of all these elements that that reinforce each other rather than diminish each other. That's really doing it. And that's mm -hmm. a difficult thing to explain. So I've looked at reviews of this game. So people generally really like it. It gets high ratings. But there are some of the, the biggest gaming websites that didn't give it nearly the thumbs up that we're giving it. One mm -hmm. prominent website gave it a 7.0 out of 10, which I thought was ridiculous. I mean, mm -hmm. that's like a C. <laughs> like, wh what? <laughs> and another one... Uh, yeah, gave it a score in that same ballpark. So why is that? And I feel like it's because if you look at it just kind of quickly and at a surface level, it isn't doing a lot of things new, like we keep saying. Also put yourself in the shoes of these professional reviewers. They're playing like so many games. They played every open world game. They're going to groan at another one. And they have a deadline. So if you're playing this game on a deadline, and maybe your 20th open world game of the year, maybe you're just not able to to, <laughs> to appreciate the nuance of what's going on here. I, I wonder if, if sure, that's yeah, yeah. part of it. But I, I hope people take a look at this. And I'm guessing right now that years and years from now, uh, a new generation of people are going to play a remake of this game, which is like almost identical, but just has better graphics and it will be on a new platform. It'll be on the PS20. <laughs> yeah. So when that comes out, people can watch this old video <laughs> and get an That's appreciation right, yeah. of the game. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, go play Ghost of Tsushima.